Uh, this is the first yellow webinar of 2024. And this is a, something special, at least for me, because I have the great pleasure to introduce a good friend of mine, a long-standing colleague, uh, a long-standing long uh, um, campaign of battles in Isol and around the world, which is Mario Rizzetto. Mario Rizzetto has no uh, need to be in, in, introduced. He discovered the hepatitis D virus and is uh, known all over the world for this important achievement. And the title of today, it's uh, Hepatitis D, New Developments. And Mario is honorary professor of gastroenterology at the University of Turin and has uh, um, um, served as an as a editor and uh, uh, secretary of ESOL in uh, different uh, uh, occasions and uh, is an outstanding scientist and good, uh, an outstanding human being. So please, Mario, start your presentation. Thank you, Claudio. My pleasure. And uh, I greet and say good afternoon, my time, to all participants. So the issue is hepatitis D or Delta virus. And I'll spend a few slides, uh, I spend a few slides of background, such as the one you see here. So the hepatitis D virus or Delta virus is unique in human pathology because it's very small. It has a genome of about 1,700 uh, nucleotide spaces. And being so small, it's unable to code on its own for structural protein, surface protein, or for enzymatic protein of its own. Thus, it is defined as a defective virus, which is dependent for its life cycle on the hepatitis B virus. The hepatitis B virus is providing to this the Delta virus, the RNA you see here is a circular genome, very small, as I said, which codes for an antigen, a small antigen with only antigenic properties, we are not aware of any function of this antigen so far. And it's coated by the HPSG provided by the competent so-called helper virus, which is the hepatitis B virus. And the HPSG is the coat of the D virus or Delta virus, interchangeable by now in the literature and also in my talk. So it's really a hybrid, a chimera that you see in this uh, slide. HPSG on the outside and the internal component of genome expressing an antigen. The, the face, uh, the true face and the electron microscopy of this virus is shown on the right. It's an amorphous particle of about 37, 36 to 37 nanometers without any structural, uh, uh, without any virological feature made up of a mixture of uh, the HBSG and HDLG. Despite being so small and so defective, so unable apparently of um, independent life, but de de become, become independent only on help with hepatitis B virus. However, the hepatitis D virus is ubiquitous. It's present worldwide, has been found almost everywhere in the world. And it, it's a most important characteristic feature for us as a clinician is that highly pathogenic, more pathogenic than the hepatitis B virus, more pathogenic than the hepatitis C virus, as a matter of fact, it is the most pathogenic virus at our latitude uh, as described so far. Okay, this said, what uh, is the help that uh, the uh, HBSG, what is the need for the HBSG by the Delta virus? The HBSG is needed by the B vir Delta virus, which you see here, right, HBSG, blue, Delta core, Delta RNA, and inner component. Well, this Delta virion, this is the virion, to enter hepatocytes needs the HBSG. And as, in fact, as a matter of fact, it enters hepatocyte with the same modality as the hepatitis B virus with its own HBSG. That is, through the entry, uh, it, it enters the hepatocyte through the attaching the sodium tyrocholic co-transporting polypeptide. Then it's moved in the nucleus, but as we see in the next slide, it's not replicated by any HBV component, does not need 
HBV to, to replicate. It needs HBSG in the form of HBSG only at this step and at the step of exit from the pathocytes. When it comes back, when it's replicated and comes back from the nucleus, it goes into the cytoplasm, becomes coated with the HBSG, and in this way, he's exported to the blood. One point, the assembly of the virus delta or the blue with the red in the cytoplasm requires the finalization by the host of the large delta antigen. I'm telling you this because we will see later in the later part of my speech, this is important for as well as this stage, of course, for the new therapeutic strategies. As I said, B is not required for replication, but how does Delta replicate then? Replication of Delta consists, is mediated, uh, occurs uh, quite uniquely through uh, the an effect of the uh, cellular enzymes. Delta, this is the genome of Delta, which is a circular strand in red here. For the replication, uh, is a linear strand of multimeric delta uh, length, uh, the infectious length size is rolled over the, um, over the genome and then it's cut by <coughs> the ribosome, so delta. Delta possesses a ribosome. The ribosome is again a unique thing to delta because it's a OD. It's an RNA stretch, stretch of delta, about 100 nucleotide, which is self-cleaving. It's a segment of the virus, of the RNA virus, which uh, uh, possesses the uh, genetic information, but also acts as a, like an enzyme and cuts the RNA, uh, the RNA multimeric evolving chain, rolling over the antigenome into linear um, segments of infectious unit. This uh, is possible thanks to this unique ribosomic activity of the virus. Then the linear segment cut by the ribosomes are linked together into a circle and uh, sorry, and ligated into the infectious antigenomic unit the clearance of the gen uh, the um, replication of the genome occurs through the same mechanism based however on the antigenome as a template now the important point is as you see here is that this uh, mechanism is mediated by the host rna polymerase <laughs> sorry delta is not replicated by a known enzyme, a polymerase, viral polymerase, or a viral uh, protein like B or C. It's replicated directly by the RNA polymerase of the host, which uh, recognize the RNA of Delta as a DNA, DNA of, their own, of their own cell. So the, 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 the RNA polymerase is deceived by the RNA of Delta to replicate itself instead than uh, DNA, organic uh, endogenous RNA. As we'll see later on, this is very important because then there is no way we can attack Delta by common antivirals, which are directed against the replicative enzymes of the virus itself. In other words, the enzymes that the virus is producing for its own, like the protease and the promolymerase of the hepatitis B and C virus. This said on uh, uh, recapitulating the basic features of Delta, let's go then to the natural history and the epidemiology. How do we make the diagnosis? It's quite simple by now. We, we check for HDV markers, serological markers in, uh, in blood, of course. And this has to be done only in HBSG positive patients because uh, it does Delta, as far as we know so far, at least the human Delta doesn't, this human Delta, that does seem to exist except in the presence of HBSG positive uh, uh, status. So 
screen the screening test for Delta is the antibody to Delta. Antibody to Delta is available commercially, especially in high-income countries, in Europe and the US, and in, uh, in um, as I said, in, in the Western world. It's well standardized. It means exposure to the virus. Usually, this exposure is translated in infection, in current infection, but it can also be present in patients who have experienced hepatitis D infection, have resolved it, and so as a marker of past infection. This is very important to remember from an epidemiological point of view. Once uh, the um, anti-Delta positivity is found, the, the HBSG patient, positive patient is found to be anti-Delta positive, then it should be tested for serum HDV RNA, which is, of course, uh, the marker of active infection and disease. Unfortunately, there is limited commercial availability uh, of this test, which is still not yet well standardized. There are prototypes, there are commercial prototypes, but in many cases, uh, many of, of the data we have from around the world are with self-made tests, which has not been confirmed in, term, in terms of reliability or reproducibility. Uh, so how does Delta then uh, D transmit? Let's remember that B, in, that is B, hepatitis B virus infection, as shown here, is a, a basic requirement. So hepatitis B can produce a, acute hepatitis, or it can produce the inactive HBSG carrier or chronic hepatitis B. This is the background, necessary background, to interpret the natural history of hepatitis delta. Once on this background you, you have, sorry, you have delta which supervenes. It can supervenes in the patients with HBSG negative, in this individuals with normal HBSG negative, and then it causes an acute co-infection by HBV and HBV, which results in a, usually in severe acute hepatitis B plus T. Now this, which is, we call co-infection by the two virus, is a transient um, infectious problem. It can be very severe clinically, can be lead to fulminant hepatitis, but co-infection, when it does not lead to death, resolves 99%. In fact, the incidence of acute HDV infection, acute HDV, HDV infection per million inhabitants in Italy has uh, dramatically declined. It was low in 1987, but now, according to the study of Strofolini, is only 0.4% in the, the recent year. So at least in our country, in Italy, it's not any, any, any problem, acute co-infection anymore. It's still a problem, however, in areas of the world where the um, HDV infection remains rampant. The second and most important, of course, mechanism of transmission of Delta is by superinfection. By superinfection, we intend the carrier of the HBSG, either asymptomatic or already uh, diseased by the HPV, which becomes superinfected by Delta. This uh, superinfection, because Delta is highly pathogenic, transform the carrier of HPSG, a symptomatic carrier of HPSG, into a patient with a chronic hepatitis D, or aggravates uh, uh, pre-existing hepatitis B, inducing an additional hepatitis D on top of hepatitis D. In fact, studies performed by Dr. Pafatovic uh, and the old literature B and C and the other viral hepatitis that we may have in our in our in our latitude. So therefore, in uh, almost seventy percent of the cases, uh, cirrhosis after superinfection is reached within five to ten days. Uh, sorry, within five to ten years. You see here that, however, this is not a constant. It's very frequent that people are superinfected 
have a chronic hepatitis D, which runs this course. But there are at least 10% of the patients superinfected who do not progress to chronicity and resolve the infection. What are the features of chronic hepatitis D? Usually they are anti-HB positive and usually the serum HBV DNA is negative or borderline. Diagnostically, this is a very important point because that here you have a patient who have a severe hepatitis, HBSG positive, you measure HBV DNA and you find it is negative or borderline, what you would call a, a level fit with, uh, for an asymptomatic HBSG carrier. Well, this is again a lack of markers of HBV DNA, HBV reprodu uh, reproductions, HBV DNA, it's a diagnostic harbinger to the presence of hepatitis D, provided, of course, there's no other hepatotoxic factor, hepatitis C, uh, alcohol, or other. This, in fact, the great majority of the patients with chronic hepatitis D are anti HB positive. However, apart from the severity of the liver disease, apart from the rapid progression to cirrhosis, there's no distinctive clinical or histological feature that uh, distinguishes hepatitis B from hepatitis B or other forms of viral hepatitis. Uh, we found long ago, and this has been confirmed also recently, that patients with chronic hepatitis D, 10% at least, uh, during the florid initial phase of the chronic hepatitis at least, uh, develop an autoantibody to liver kidney microsomal antibodies, antigens, sorry, called liver kidney microsomal antibody type 3, which is different uh, in the antigenic um, target from the autoantibodies to LKM or of autoimmune hepatitis but type 2, but very similar, identical in terms of fluorescence. One point, uh, we don't see this anymore, but they keep on seeing it in, in Asia and in Africa. So occasionally, patients with chronic hepatitis D have enormous splenomegaly, you see here this uh, resonance uh, image of the abdomen, and this is the spleen not correlated to the extent of portal hypertension, but the spleen from the other patients who has a chronic HDV disease. Well, what is the impact of uh, uh, hepatitis D in uh, numerical terms? What is the prevalence? Here it's a, a, a difficult point because if we look at the meta-analysis performed in the last uh, few years, we see that uh, the uh, prevalence of Delta of D has varied between 12 millions, sorry, 12 millions to 72 millions. Clearly there's something uh, erratic that is uh, incongruous in this evaluation. And uh, this is because there is erratic screening and lack of testing in many cases, possibly in, in, this, uh, in, in this review, or lack of insufficient of data of insufficient quality that can be compared. But as we see a bit later, there is also a major problem in sampling of the patients who have to be tested for measuring the prevalence of data. So the sampling bias in testing for data is quite important. This is the, the panorama, this is the, uh, the, the, the background. We have to remember that uh, in the last 30 years, uh, we have a, a vaccination against hepatitis B, which is available, at least in high income countries, and now is available in many middle income and middle low income countries throughout the world. And of course, because uh, <clears throat> HDV depends on the HPV, vaccination, the optimal success in many areas of vaccination against hepatitis B is changing or has changed already the epidemiology of HDV, diminishing, of course, the prevalence of this infection as cutting HPV uh, infection, diminishing the number of HPV carriers, you are cutting the grass upon which HDV can thrive and survive. 
So, in fact, uh, in high-income countries, I intend as high-income countries, all Europe, North America, Australia, Japan, well, the control of HPV, which is optimal after 30 years of vaccination, has led to an optimal control of HPV, which means that HPV has much declined in this country in the last 30 years compared to the first time we described Delta in the early 80s. However, this is not only in high-income countries, but HPV vaccination has now been implemented in many other countries. AIDS with control uh, uh, in these countries, other than the high-income countries, is dependent on the baseline prevalence of HPV, duration of the vaccination program, which is in many, or shorter duration than in the industrialized world, and delivery facilities, which have led to uh, availability of the vaccine. So if we try to have a picture of, of a, a tentative picture of the prevalence of hepatitis D in the world by now, the only thing that we are certain of is what happens in the yellow countries, which is, of course, uh, countries of, as I said, uh, high income or uh, in countries in, in, uh, in yellow, uh, countries in um, South Af um, uh, America where historically the prevalence of Delta was low. And we know that in a yellow country, the prevalence now of Delta is low or very low in domestic populations. However, it's coming back in the last 20 years in immigrants who come to Europe, who come to the US, in Europe from Romania, in Europe from um, Russia, in the uh, United States, from China, from Mexico. And uh, the prevalence, the number of patients are re researching in these areas of, of low domestic prevalence because of the influx of immigrants. There are intermediate areas that we can that are depicted in green light where vaccination is on track and it has already diminished the Delta infections, but yet the, the diminution is intermediate. Then there are areas in green, dark green, oh, sorry, especially those in Africa and in uh, India and part of China, where the prevalence uh, seems is intermediate. It's a bad term intermediate, but that's what I can say in terms of quant in, uh, quantitative quantitation. And uh, the data however, in many, for many of these countries are not reliable. And then there are the countries, the poor countries, usually the most poor countries of the world, Central Africa, Central Asia, where the prevalence instead of Delta is very high. And this is because the prevalence in these countries of the necessary hepatitis BV endemicity remains very high. In all the red, red countries, the mm, rate of HPSG carriers in the population is more than 3%. In many parts of Africa, more than 5%. So, this is the big geological picture that we can depict the present. And as I said, the only certainty in epidemiological terms are the yellow countries, where for certain the rate of delta has diminished a lot. If we now go to Italy as paradigmatic of the countries with high. Um, in high prevalence with uh, good con optimal control of HPV, we think there are no more than 77,000 patients with Delta infection now in the country, all more or less cirrhotics or very advanced cirrhotic fibrotic disease. These are data from collected by my colleague Caviglia recently. In fact, uh, already in 2017, Dr. Strofolini could establish that uh, among patients, Italian patients younger than 30 years, only 3% had antibody to Delta. But as I said, paradigmatic of all what's happening in the uh, developing, developed world, HV is replaced by immigrants. Strofolini again established that in 2019, migrants with HDB disease to native Italians were 26.4% versus 6.4%. 
So the immigrants were overwhelmingly more positive for them than HPSG positive, of course, than the current Italian domestic population. It's interesting to see that despite the very low prevalence now in domestic areas like Italy of Delta infection, however, the need for liver transplantation remains high for patients with HDV. And this is logical because there are still cohorts of long ago infected patients who now have fibrotics, as are almost all those uh, native Italians, which uh, for only the only the poor of, uh, in which to whom the only uh, solution, medical solution is transplantation. As we see here, in the last 10 years, the number of patients transplanted in Torino for HBV versus those transplanted for Delta was the same. And of course now this number is still increasing because it's the influx of immigrants. The situation is different. This is sorry, it's going automatically on its own sometimes, this computer. Uh, the situation is different in uh, Asia and Africa, in the areas, of course, where the prevalence of HIV SIG is very high. The burden of hepatitis D is high. Sorry for the mistake in many countries. It's uh, the prevalence is very well defined. The data of prevalence are often inconsistent. There are sampling bias. Low rates of anti-delta that are determined at convenient screening at uh, uh, blood banks uh, in HPS carriers a small risk of HDV do not reflect the epidemiology of HBV. Global burden of HBV should be identified only in HPSG carriers with liver disease, best in cirrhosis. And this is why, because as I said, antibody to delta would be found in 90% of patients with severe liver disease, and in 10% of patients with re resolved the chronic infection. So the chances of finding anti-Delta throughout the spectrum of HBSG of liver disorders is 10 times higher in cirrhotic patients than it is at blood banks at pregnancy clinics. And simply because 90% of those who become infected with Delta become infected with the virus, which generates a progressive disease. This is important in epidemiological evaluation because as I said, Many people judge the prevalence of Delta going to the blood banks and HBSG carriers of the blood banks <laughs> in this area like Asia and Africa, not going to those where it would be more pertinent to find the rate of HDV like severe liver disease. And this is shown quite nicely in recent studies in, in where you, 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 you look, for instance, at the prevalence of antibody to Delta in Asia, in Africa, and you see there is a big quantitative difference when the patients were, the, 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 the HDV infection was documented, had a clinical liver disease, were chronic HIV carriers with severe liver, liver disease, or those which were collected at the blood bank's pregnancy clinic. Within some areas like Egypt, if they were collected in blood banks, it's 4%. But when they were collected in, in, in the upper Nile, in, 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 in clinic for liver disease or in, uh, in uh, facilities for liver disease, it was 43%. And the same is true in, in, uh, in Senegal and in other parts of, 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 of Africa. So this is to say that the prevalence of Delta that we have so far, at least from areas like, like Af many countries of Africa and uh, uh, Asia, it's not reliable and because it's not homogeneous, based on homogeneous um, su uh, clinical substrate. It's a sampling bias error that makes a, a lot of confusion and probably justifies the difference of prevalence worldwide we've seen those from 12 to 72 million people. So what then, uh, how should then uh, uh, HDV be tested? Now, APAS and NISL do recommend that all HBSG carriers should be tested for Delta regardless of their demographic or clinical characteristic. In other words, once you see an HBSG carrier, 
This should be tested immediately for antidester by reflex testing. This is the algorithm of immediately testing for the antibody, regardless of the characteristic of the patients who has been found HBSG positive. And this seems very important to prevent at least overlooking the diagnosis of Delta infection because many patients are not tested, still testing for anti-Delta, even in high-income countries like the US and in, in, in part Italy and part of Europe is, is limited, is neglected. So finally, the most, uh, if you want, exciting part uh, though still uh, waiting for, for real perspective, is uh, what's happening about therapies. What do we have in terms of therapies? Well, in terms of therapies, we have, and this is the only approved therapies, at least approved by scientific societies, uh, uh, not, not by... by um, at, as, at, uh, um, organization. We use, have been using PEG interferon, obtaining sustained viral responses, which is the clearance of serum HDVR. However, Note that in the late grand majority of those, of this minority of uh, uh, patients who clear HDV RNA, serum HSG is persisting, does not go away. And in also in this 30%, there is a high rate of relapses post therapy. Therefore, the real number is difficult to evaluate. There is no more than 15, 18, 20% in some series of. Fs who are maintained over time. Recent strategies is not applicable because you, you don't have a, 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 replic a replication machinery that can be targeted by antivirus, by conventional antivirus, like I repeat myself, polymerases and protease. Well, then the targeting is uh, the, 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 the therapies are now targeted to the HBSG. So they are targeted to block the entrance of the virions through the inhibition of the attachment of the HBSG to the NTCP. Other mechanism, the targeting is aimed at blocking the, 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 the combination, the assembly of the HPSG with, uh, with, the, with the delta by blocking the fernization of a del large delta antigen, which as shown before is necessary to lead to the assembly of the virion. And then there are the uh, nucleic acid polymers that apparently redux, reduce the number of subviral HPSG particle or empty HPSG particles. Well, these drugs are also in study as new therapies, as new strategies to try to get reason of hepatitis D. However, there is a big thing which you have to keep in mind. That the, though the SVR paradigm has been used, for, 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 for decades for that uh, same way as it applied to hepatitis C, for instance, well, it does not work for HPV in the, with the same efficacy. And why does HSVR, though used traditionally, that do not uh, correspond to clearance uh, in many, many times, many cases of HDV RNA? This is because we know from studies performed long ago, and now there's a review of Dr. Ponsetto in, in this, HDV was transmitted to HBSG carrier chimpanzees by infectious serum diluted 10 to the minus 11. Here you see what is a dilution of 10 to the minus 11. It's really a, 
uh, an ML, one ML of infectious serum diluted in a small alpine lake. You mix up, take one ML of the mixer, and this is still transmitted uh, to this dilution, uh, delta infection to the chimpanzee. Therefore, wh why this happens? Because the HBSG then acts as a, a trap, as a magnet to delta if it's present. In other words, if there is an HBSG background uh, which remains in the liver. Many patients who have uh, cleared apparently by SBR, HDVRNA, well, if there is a remaining HBSG, HBSG background, this can rescue amounts of HDV far lower than those detectable by current assay. Only six international units per milliliter. Here we, 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 we speak of one to the minus 11 dilution of serum. So, I'm oh, sorry. HPSG persisting in liver can rescue HDB after apparently successful therapy. And therefore, HDB relapses frequently occur after successful therapy. With interferon, so far, almost 60% over the long term of nine years, of those who apparently had a SBR but remained HBSG positive have recapitulated and have relapsed their hepatitis D. Therefore, the major point to discuss and to have in mind with Delta is what is the endpoint, therapy endpoint. Clearly, from what I told you, the best, the ideal, the only reliable, really reliable serum endpoint would be serum HBSG, the clearance of HBSG. But this is virtually impossible, or but well, it's it's rarely achievable in clinical practice, so it's more a chimera than a real endpoint. Therefore, surrogate endpoints have been worked out. The most used so far, as I said before, reiterating, however, it's a, a surrogate, not a, a definitive uh, diagnostic market, is the clearance of HDNA as, as by force SVR, but this has led with the interferon to a lot of relapses. Now, according to the next expert opinion, in the last three years, and with the new drugs, the endpoint has been established or has been identified also as an RNA decrease or more than two logs, 10, from the initial original theta. In other words, if you decrease HDV RNA by at least two logs, this is a possible uh, reliable endpoint. And this has been the, is the basis now of uh, the construction of the design of recent studies with the new drugs that I told you before, that I showed you before. This study, MIR-301, has been recently published by Dr. Wedemeyer in the New England of Medicine. What he did, he, uh, let's go to the, to, to the most important part. He gave Boulevard Tide two milligrams daily, subcutaneous, to 49 patients, sorry, but, or Boulevard Tide 10 milligrams to 50 patients. The process, uh, uh, the, the, the therapeutic process is going on until uh, one um, for, for three years. We now have the data at 48 weeks, uh, those published by Wedemeyer at the, in the New England Journal of Medicine. But of course, this is ongoing and we'll have to see over the long term how it works. What are the data that has shown uh, Wedemeyer? Wedemeyer has used the clearance, the two log clearance, two log diminution of HDV RNA from baseline. According to this definition, then in this uh, 99 patient treated with Boulevard Tide 2 milligrams or Boulevard Tide 10 milligrams, sorry, let me say it. 26% of them were non responders in that they had a decline of less than 2 log 10. 16% were responders, in that they had, sorry, I, I don't know why these computers 
goes in, on its own and there's nothing I can do. 16% uh, uh, were responders. They became negative for HDV RNA. Then uh, there are 58% of the patients which have been defined as responders in this study, at least uh, according to the original definition of response, in which the, the RNA declined by two or more log from the original variant theta. And in these patients, uh, ALT is normal in 67 of the patients, but abnormal in, remain abnormal in 38. Note that in no case of patients given bulevertida alone, there's been the clearance of serum HBSRG. So the big problem here is that despite the good data, at least from the clinical point of view, because normality of, 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 uh, of ALT goes up from 67 plus 60, uh, 16 of responders. Well, what happens when you suspend therapy? Because of course, HBSG is there, and so if some traces of HDV RNA remains, which are not detectable by current assay, there is the high risk of recurrence. More exciting in a sense, but here again, uh, in uh, interim research, there is this study, which is uh, um, um, MIR-2.0, uh, presented recently by Tariq Asela at the last ASLD, where bulevertide 2 milligrams, bulevertide 10 milligrams have been given together with peg interferon alpha versus, take it this way, bulevertide 10 milligram alone. And we have the data at week 120, which is the primary endpoint. So people have been treated for 96 weeks, then followed for another 24 weeks to this primary endpoint. What are the results? As you see, these are the patients given combination of peg interferon plus bulevertide. These are the combination of the patients given only bulevertide 2, bulevertide 10 milligram. At the end of treatment, 70% of the patients treated with a combination of bulvertide plus interferon, bulvertide 10 milligram, had obtained an SVR. SVR. And uh, this occurred in 44% of the patients who had been treated with peg interferon plus bulvertide 2 milligrams. This is much lower values of uh, uh, SVR with bulevertide alone. However, 40, 24 weeks. Okay, are you with me? Yes. Sorry for the inconvenience, but this is the machine and uh, I'm being, <laughs> as you see here, the percentage, uh, the sum that the conclusion is that the percentage of responses SVR by the combination of interferon plus bulevertide in particular, plus bulevertide 10 milligram is quite high, but is not maintained over time. In that, this is the e end of treatment response of 70%. But if you go 24 after the uh, dismissing, discontinuing therapy, the percentage had fallen to 48%. And a similar, proportionally similar percentage is seen over uh, the, la the other the other um, uh, type of therapies. So the conclusion apparently from this data is that peg interferon plus bulevertide 10 milligram, at least in the, I wouldn't say the immediate, but for, for 24 months of therapy, provides a much better response in virological terms but again, the issue is that once you suspend therapy, everything comes back. Because note that I'm going back to the protocol. The therapy has been followed first at bulevertide plus peg interferon, but has been followed by bulevertide alone. But bulevertide alone could not in itself prevent the uh, recrudescence of HDV RNA in about a a fourth or fifth of the patients, uh, which has measured at this point, uh, 
at by this point it was 24 to 30 percent less than here and even with uh, this combination hbsg has not been seen in patients treated the clearance has not been seen in patients given interferon has not been seen in patients given bulvertide but it has been seen in a minority of patients given bulvertide plus interferon in a kind of promise that possibly this could be the ultimate therapy in terms of HPSG clearance. Uh, it's difficult to conclude from therapy from the data available. Bulvertide has an advantage, a conspicuous advantage of an ALT in the interim but we don't know how this will be prolonged by therapy alone. Certainly the <laughs> efficacy of bulevertide in on HDV RNA, it's limited. Now, whether the two log decline, it's a valid uh, surrogate for, 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 for end, surrogate endpoint is debatable because as far as I know, there is no evidence that any, the presence, that any 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 value of uh, HDV RNA, even the low ones, is not pathogenic. However, we have to see the completion of all these studies and hope for, and 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 wait and hope that the, this this uh, it, uh, alternative provided by uh, Bulevertide might somehow results especially in combination with interferon in a better results. Uh, final slide, uh, remember that uh, what we know now is that interferon is not only an immunomodulator. Dr. Zan could show that HDV can propagate among daughter, daughter cells by cell division, both in vitro and in vivo. In other words, HDV can propagate in by dividing cells like 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 a chromosome, but this division is prevented, suppressed by interferon. So interferon has an effect on um, in in in, in uh, cell division, HBSG independent cell division, and this might explain its complementary effect besides the immunomodulatory effect that we have seen uh, with uh, the combination of interferon plus bulevertide. In conclusion, HD infection is present worldwide, is diminishing in many countries with implementation of vaccination against HPV. Chronic hepatitis D is the more severe of uh, uh, chronic viral hepatitis. And, uh, oh, sorry, I've already lost it. Can you see me? And new therapies. Yes, we can see you promised to improve therapeutic efficacy. This is my conclusion. I had another couple of slides, uh, and uh, but I would uh, skip them. It's only I can, and, and they're very simple, but very exciting. New data, apart from pathology in, on men, have shown that uh, sequences uh, of delta 50% at least homology have been found in uh, fish, in amphibian, in invertebrates, uh, without any hepatomavirus, without any HPV virus. So the question is, and this is the final part, which is uh, 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 a sweet part of it. Uh, the, the hypothesis now is what does this HPV-like viruses throughout uh, the whole, apparently the whole history of the metazoa represent in uh, oncogenesis? We don't know, but this is exciting to understand that possibly we don't only have HDV as a human virus, but HDV-like virus have survived, are generated long, long ago, and are present throughout the whole ontogenetic uh, on metazoscape. I finish here. I'm sorry for the for the inconvenience, but uh, that that's that's the point. I'll have to change the computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Mario. It was a wonderful uh, uh, lecture in spite of the, the troubles related to the connection. Uh, I think you made uh, the point, and then, uh, now it's clear that what you discovered almost 40 years ago <laughs> is, is growing and is, is still um, 
keeping all of us busy in terms of uh, clinicians and researchers.